y'all, Scott here, and it's time to mosey on over the entire galaxy to discover the world of video game gimmicks. Time to set coordinates for numbers, and lots of them. Well, it looks like we're getting a transmission from the planet Wagwan. Oh, please God, help! I don't want to look like a jackass playing Wii music! Oh, God. It looks like this is what happens when... Gimmicks go too far. Many call them intrusive, unnecessary, stupid, dumb, stupid, and dumb. They've plagued video games for as long as they've existed, and for at least the next 10 minutes. Gimmicks are crucial in business to ensure differentiation. You have to stand up from the crowd and offer something that sounds compelling enough to get consumers to bite. Take for example, Toys R Us's new gimmick is insane price cuts and people are flocking to the stores, they should do these sales more often. The term gimmick has often been associated with video games, especially within the past decade or so with the introduction of Hey, it's an easy way to get people either not initially interested in a particular game or video games in general to bring a copy up to the register. I think most people started throwing around the term in association with video games when a certain game console that goes by the alias of I set Nintendo back five years came out, but gimmicks have been a part of video games ever since they became a commercial product. The first game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, basically was just a bunch of variations of Pong with transparent overlays you put on a screen to simulate graphics and different game genres. Gimmick. The power glove for the NES, motion controlled mitten, gimmick, wireless controllers, gimmick, adding new power ups to games, gimmick, anything new added to a product or a reason to buy it is technically a gimmick, which definitely negates a lot of the negative connotations the term has. They can be incredibly beneficial, for crying out loud, a gimmick saved the video game industry. Rob the Robot was packed in with the NES at launch to convey that it wasn't a video game console after Atari mucked out hard. Rob was a gimmick to showcase how the NES was a toy. And it worked. The Nintendo 64 introduced the Rumble Pack, shaking the controller when the action on screen heated up. Definitely unnecessary, but Rumble has been a staple in video game controllers ever since the Rumble Pack's introduction, and without it, we wouldn't have gotten one to switch. Light guns, you don't need them, but Unreal shooters wouldn't be the same without these things. And imagine Dance Dance Revolution without the dance pad, it's just a revolution at that point. God, I've been waiting to scoff at something today, that'll do. Gimmicks may be unnecessary, but they can be fun additions that spice things up and eventually turn into necessities. However, if they bog down the experience and make it less usable or fun at the expense of adding a bullet point on the back of the box, that's when everybody starts to pout. Like I said, gimmicks can be good. These gimmicks just went too far. You know what was like the lamest gimmick ever? Blowing into the microphone. I know the blowing into the mic fan patrol will rush to defend the thing, but I never found it to be that great. Doing this is such a turnoff. It's often exclusively in games that just don't work where you have to stop and blow into the microphone, i.e. every game it's in. Actually, it works all right with Nintendogs. Problem is, there's gonna be a good 12 miles worth of spit on your screen. Who doesn't love plastic shells to pop your controller into? The classic turn my Wii remote into a baseball bat initiative every company attempts at some point. These things were the craze back in the Wii era, as in they were easy gifts to buy somebody who owns a Wii. Nintendo themselves took part in the trend with the Wii Wheel and Wii Zapper. Sometimes these things help certain games feel more immersive, I guess. I mean, as immersive as you can make Link's crossbow training in Mario Kart Wii, but most of the third-party ones that pertain to Wii Sports were just... lame. Dangling nostalgia in front of our faces has been a popular gimmick lately, with the likes of Mario, Zelda, and Sonic cramming in a fair amount of beloved retro throwbacks in almost every one of their recent games. It's a given that a newly released game in a beloved older series will have some sort of nostalgia crammed in it. Wolfenstein The New Order has a playable Wolfenstein 3D Easter egg, Uncharted 4 has a playable level of Crash Bandicoot, Sonic Mania, in general. This isn't bad by any means, but let me tell you, I've seen at the very least too many 8-bit Mario sprites in the latest few games, and seeing one has lost all meaning. It just kind of feels like we're obsessed with the past, or we'd rather exploit our old creations you love rather than make new creations you love. I've talked before about why I really still appreciate and like the Wii, but that doesn't mean I don't hate it. God, Steven really did a number to our sarcasm barrier. If I could sue a game controller, I would first go after whatever the hell this third-party Wii U controller is, and then sue the Wii Remote for deception. The trailers Nintendo produced for the Wii implied the Wii Remote was much more capable of precise motion control movement than it really was. Combined with the manure pile of games that exploited the Wii Remote's controls with little thought or care and the Wii's general audience of casual gamers, and the introduction of the Wii Motion Plus that actually made the Wii Remote function how it was originally advertised to, the Wii was consistently called a gimmick. While I don't think the entirety of the Wii was a gimmick, the motion controls were definitely better than a traditional controller in some cases, 
it's hard to argue that a good chunk of the console's identity was nothing more than one. But you wanna know when Nintendo took the Wii's gimmick too far? Uh, nothing like a Wii Vitality sensor announcement to consistently make you wake up in a cold sweat. This was just riding on the coattails of the success of Wii Fit. They never announced how it would play into any form of software. It never came out, but they did say they would want to try bringing it out when the technology advances, so it'll be back, mark my words. When a gimmick is successful, others take note. As you can see here, we have two examples of add-ons with a case of Wii gimmick-itis, both releasing in 2010. First up, the Kinect, whose gimmick relied on ousting the Wii's gimmick as yesterday's news with its own hands-free gimmick. The Xbox 360's Kinect was advertised as life without a controller, and everybody who didn't know what a video game controller was shouted, SOLD! After using it, almost every application using the Kinect was hands down much slower, and in some cases more frustrating and confusing than using an actual controller. That didn't stop game companies from saying, you know what would be better with Kinect? Mass Effect 3! That's a f ugly idea barrier too! The Kinect was a complete gimmick, which did nothing but annoy Xbox owners. Using it was a hassle, and most of the games that required it were lame. The only decent application it had was dancing games. But things went too far when Microsoft announced that the Xbox One was going to require the use of Kinect. You had to keep the thing plugged in for the console to even function. Of course, they realized that they actually wanted the Xbox One to sell well, and they removed the requirement. But still, nobody used the original version of Kinect and said, now this is what I call controlling a video game. It was sloppy, imprecise, and just not fun to use after the initial startup. Sony dabbled in motion controls before the great 2010 plague occurred. One was the iToy for the PlayStation 2, a cute little device that is comparable to the Kinect, but wasn't pushed as hard. But we're talking this. The PlayStation Move was Sony running down the stairs to hop on the motion control bandwagon and falling down the first 24 flights of 24 flights of stairs. The Move was technologically more advanced and precise than the Wii Remote, utilizing a glowing orb to track movement, However, I don't think any Wii owners saw the move as an upgrade for the ages. It was more of a Wii for owners of the PS3 already, not a reason to buy a PS3. Which is why seeing games require or emphasize the move controller became a bit too much. However, the era of gimmicks continued on with Wii U. I think this was a more offensive gimmick than the Wii, because at least with the Wii, people knew what the gimmick was, and they wanted it for that reason. I don't even know what a Wii U is, you're expecting me to know what its gimmick was? After doing some research, the ancient scrolls foretold that the Wii U's gimmick was the Wii U gamepad, having an extra screen on the controller that could be used for god knows what. The problem was, the benefit of having an extra screen was only really seen as a benefit to those who already owned a Wii U. I think most people who saw this thing said, why would I need that? The gimmick didn't lure people in and made the overall package much more expensive. And on top of that, various games utilized the second screens in ways that made the games lesser experiences. Paper Mario Color Splash, Star Fox Zero, it clunked up the control, overcomplicated things. It wasn't pretty sometimes. Now that's not to say the second screen wasn't used in good ways, but the lack of software that truly took advantage of the two screens says right there that Nintendo just saw the Wii U's gamepad as a gimmick and not something to make gameplay better. The Wii U's successor, the Nintendo Switch, definitely does a gimmick right. I mean, you want to use the system as just a home console? Leave it right there. Want to play it portably? Take it out. Blam. Play the way you want to play. The gimmick is understandable, useful, and doesn't affect gameplay negatively. The same can be said about the Nintendo 3DS. Class is free 3D. You can use it if you're into that sort of thing. You can turn it off if you're a total prude. Gimmicks aren't inherently bad. They're vital to keeping things fresh. Anything new can be labeled as a gimmick. But of course, the word is often associated with lame additions to things. A bad gimmick is something that is merely added to slap a selling point on the box. It has no real benefits and often comes with problems. The cons simply outweigh the pros. The Kinect, Wii U, the Power Glove, all gimmicks that were merely marketing tools. A gimmick goes too far when it's crammed down the consumer's throat and is simply here to sell the product with no real benefits. In fact, some downsides that wouldn't be here without it. Gimmicks work best when they're thought of by designers, artists, the creative teams producing the product. They're more thoughtful, generally have more value and worth in them, and possibly enhance the product like crazy this way. When marketing creates a gimmick and then tells the creative team to make something around it, good things can come out of that, but we generally get stuff like, ugh, yikes, and eek. Forcing motion controls down throats, a feature that just doesn't work as advertised, changing gameplay for the sake of advertising instead of, you know, Gameplay. I like me a good gimmick if it's well thought out and doesn't bog anything down, but a lot of what we went over today, yeah, parasites. Well, it looks like my journey today has come to an end. It's been an honor to serve a part of the fellow unity of certified killers of bad astronomic resistant near duels. 
should really look into an abbreviation for that. It's also an honor to be a part of this whole 1950s B-movie shtick. Remember, it's not a phase, it's a lifestyle. It was a phase.